Now, the first three kings of Judah, Saul, David, and Solomon, their stories are told in great detail at considerable length in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st Kings, as well as in 1st and parts of 2nd Chronicles. Each of these kings reigns for 40 years, covering the time span of roughly 1050 BC to 930 BC. And not only are these king stories told at length in the histories of the Bible, but they are also contributors or authors of other books such as Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And so the lives of these three kings in the Old Testament is indeed momentous. Furthermore, these three kings, and David in particular, is mentioned repeatedly in the prophets and through the New Testament as well. And so these figures have considerable bearing on the Bible as a whole. However, after the reign of Solomon, there follows a succession of 20 monarchs, 19 kings, and one queen that rule over Judah. Their stories are told in 1 Kings 12 through 2 Kings 25 and 2 Chronicles 10 through 36. Altogether, however, the lives of these kings, as recounted in the Bible, are much briefer, sometimes told in just a paragraph or two, and usually containing such important information as their parentage, how old they were when they came to the throne, the number of years they served as king, and some incidental aspects about their lives. And while some stories and adventures are recounted in some detail, in general, the material covering these kings is much briefer in comparison to the first three kings of Saul, David, and Solomon. And there are a couple difficulties at play in telling the story of these kings of Judah. The first is that the lives of the kings of Judah run parallel with the kings of Israel, the kingdom of the northern ten tribes. And in a few cases, with Joram, Joash, and Ahaziah, the kings of Judah shared names with kings of Israel, which can be slightly confusing. Furthermore, some of the kings of Judah go by varying names. Jehoram is known as Joram, Jehoash goes by Joash, Abijam sometimes goes by Abijah, and Azariah in some parts goes as Uzziah. And also, as recounted in 1st and 2nd Kings, the stories of the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel are told consecutively and alternating back and forth, and so a clear picture can be difficult to come by. In this video, we'll be focusing just on the first 12 kings and queen of the kingdom of Judah, and we'll come back in a later video to tell the story of the kings of Israel. Now, in addition to telling the story of the lives of the king and the great exploits that happened during their reigns, the histories of the Bible also make important evaluations on how their reigns went. This is the most important aspect of the reigns of these kings and it is in large part why these histories are told in the Bible. For each king is evaluated by how faithful they were to God. And this evaluation, given at the beginning of the life of each king, largely judges the kings based on their adherence to the first two of the Ten Commandments, whether they worshiped God alone and whether they worshiped any idols. The great problem in the kingdom began with Solomon. For though he had built the temple, though he was widely renowned as a king of peace and of great prosperity, and was one of the wisest people who ever lived, yet nonetheless, in his later years, he abandoned exclusive worship of God and adopted worship of the gods of his wives. His judgment and the effects on the kingdom for his change in heart is told in 1 Kings chapter 11. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your mind, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son, for the sake of David my servant, 
and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And after the reign of Solomon, when the united monarchy is split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, the kings that follow engage in a greater to lesser degree in these same practices of worshiping foreign gods. This involves, as recounted in the Bible, worshiping at high places, that is, shrines or altars built on the top of hills or mountains, whereby incense or sacrifice could be made to these foreign deities. In particular, there is worship of Baal or Baal, which can refer to a variety of Levantine deities, but most frequently it refers to a deity of storms and fertility worshipped by the Canaanites. Furthermore, there is worship of Asherah, a consort goddess to the deity Baal. There is worship of other gods, there is practice of a variety of divinations, and most shockingly, some of the kings take up or endorse practices of child sacrifice and or cultic prostitution, both of which were religious practices of some neighboring tribes. Now, some of the kings are more faithful, putting away these adopted religious practices, but some are less scrupulous, adopting them wholeheartedly and even undoing some aspects of worship of God. And consequently, the kingdom suffers sometimes by drought or by plague, but most frequently by defeat at the hands of their neighbors on account of their unfaithfulness. However, while these sins of unfaithfulness are recounted in considerable detail in these histories, the books of the prophets add another perspective to the situation. For this is the era of the prophets, who almost all live during these reigns of the kings of Judah. And in the prophets, we find abundant rebukes of the kings and of the people, in part, yes, for unfaithfulness, but also for other practices, such as neglecting the orphan and the widow and the poor, of oppressing, of cheating and stealing, of taking life, of neglecting the Sabbath, and so forth. And these two great sources, the histories and the prophets, offer complementary views that help us to gain a complete picture of what is happening at this period of time. And so with all that introduction, we'll now go through the first 12 kings and first queen of Judah, covering the period of roughly 930 to 722 BC, and giving some mention as to who they were and what their reigns were like. The first king after Solomon was Solomon's son Rehoboam. Unfortunately, he wasn't what you might call tactful, and his first act divided the kingdom. Upon his enthronement as king, the people plead with him to reduce their load, for Solomon had demanded much from them. Rehoboam, however, takes the counsel of his younger friends and essentially says that his father was weak and that he would increase the burden on the people of Israel. Until this moment, all the people of Israel had been unified. Since entering into the promised land under Joshua, continuing through the time of the judges, and under the first three kings in a united monarchy, the 12 tribes of Israel had existed as one, excepting a couple brief periods of time of civil war. However, at this point, the 10 northern tribes of Israel formally split off and proclaim Jeroboam as their king and the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, consolidate to form the southern kingdom of Judah. Jeroboam, king of the northern kingdom, realizes that the people in worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem would likely be drawn back towards unification with Judah, sets up his own system of worship, establishing altars at Bethel and Dan. This proves to be a major problem in the long run for Jeroboam and Israel. However, at this moment, Rehoboam assembles his armies to attack Israel for separating from them. The prophet Shemaiah, however, counsels against civil war with their brethren, and the armies go home. This isn't the end of Rehoboam's problems, however. As King Shishak of Egypt comes up against Judah in his later years, and Rehoboam pays him off, with the treasures of the temple, that he might go home and leave Judah alone. War, however, does flare up with the northern kingdom of Israel, and the scriptures say there was war between the two kingdoms continually. 
And 1 Kings chapter 14 records this in summary about Rehoboam's leadership. Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they committed, more than all of their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places and pillars, and Asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. It is not a good beginning at all to this new kingdom of Judah. The next king is Rehoboam's son Abijam, also known as Abijah in Chronicles. He has a relatively brief reign of three years, but during his kingship, the war with Israel continues. His brief reign is summarized in 1 Kings chapter 15. And he walked in all the sins which his father did before him. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him, and establishing Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And this is a sense of the summaries that precede the descriptions of the reign for each of the kings of Judah and of Israel. The next king is King Asa, who fortunately is a good king. 1 Kings 15 describes him as such. He put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. He also removed Maacah his mother from being queen mother because she had an abominable image made for Asherah. And Asa cut down her image and burned it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days. And he brought into the house of the Lord the votive gifts of his father and his own votive gifts silver and gold and vessels. It is refreshing here to have a good king. Asa is also known for repelling the attacks of Israel, where he allies himself with and pays tribute to the king of Syria to attack Israel on his behalf. After this attack by Ben-Hadad of Syria, the war with Israel subsides. And also, Asa had diseased feet in his old age. The next king is Jehoshaphat, a good king. He is known for making peace with Israel and even for allying with Israel against Syria. Unfortunately, the king of Israel, Ahab, dies in the battle, but peace with Israel is secured. Furthermore, Jehoshaphat builds a fleet of ships to sail to Ophir for gold, as in the time of Solomon. However, the fleet founders. The next king, sadly, is a bad king, King Jehoram, also known as Joram. He marries a daughter of the king of Israel, Athaliah, and takes on many of the abominable practices of the kingdom of Israel. During the reign of Joram, Edom, which had formerly paid tribute to Judah, revolts. And even though Joram is successful, his army flees, and the Edomites remain in revolt. The next king is Ahaziah, also known as Jehoahaz. He, like his father, was a bad king. But nonetheless, he continues the alliance with Israel, fighting against Syria at Ramoth Gilead. Unfortunately, in a complicated situation pertaining to the bad governance of Israel, Jehu is anointed as king over Israel, and he promptly kills King Joram of Israel. Azariah gets mixed up in the situation at Jezreel, and he too is killed by Jehu, along with 42 of his kinsmen and many others. It's a very messy affair. Sadly, Ahaziah reigns in Judah only one year. After the brief reign of Ahaziah, Judah's one and only queen comes to power. She is Ahaziah's mother and the daughter of King Ahab of Israel and follows many of Israel's bad practices. On coming to the throne, she has all the royal family killed to secure her position. However, Ahaziah's sister hides one of his sons, Joash, in the temple until his seventh year when the high priest conspires with the guard to proclaim him as the new king of Judah. Athaliah the queen protests and cries treason, but the guard, the priest, and seemingly the people are on Joash's side, and her reign comes abruptly to an end. Joash, fortunately for Judah, is a good king. 
and a long king, reigning for 40 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he rebuilt the temple, providing stone and timber for its maintenance. Sadly, however, the reign of Joash, also known as Jehoash, comes prematurely to an end, as he is killed by two of his servants. The next king, Amaziah, is, much like his father Joash, a good king. Indeed, he is described in 2 Kings 14, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did in all things as Joash his father had done. But the high places were not removed, the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. While Amaziah and the two kings that follow were good kings, nonetheless, some bad practices still existed in the land. Amaziah successfully defeats the Edomites. However, he also challenges the king of Israel and is subsequently defeated. The wall in Jerusalem is in part destroyed, and as in previous occasions, the treasure of the temple is plundered. And sadly, too, at the end of his reign, there is a conspiracy against him, and he is killed, just like his father Joash. The next king is Azariah, most commonly known as Uzziah. Uzziah has the longest reign, at 52 years. Unfortunately, however, he was struck with leprosy, and his son Jotham reigned in his stead for part of his reign. Jotham, like the preceding three kings, was also a good king. He is known for building the upper gate to the temple. However, during his reign, Syria and Israel ally against him and begin to make war against the kingdom of Judah. The next king, King Ahaz, is a very bad king. Indeed, he is one of the worst. His reign is summarized in 2 Kings chapter 16. And Ahaz did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering, according to the abominable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the peoples of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. During his time, Syria and Israel continued their campaign against Judah. And Ahaz, in a desperate situation, appeals to Assyria, another power, he submits and pays tribute to King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria, who subsequently attacks Syria, destroying it. Assyria kills the king of Syria, and Ahaz, going to Damascus to meet King Tiglath-Pileser, copies their mode of worship and sends description of their altar back to Jerusalem, where it is rebuilt in the temple. Ahaz thereby adopts the worship practices of Assyria and even disassembles some of the components of Jerusalem's temple. For these and for all his other actions, King Ahaz is known as a very bad king. Fortunately for Judah, however, following King Ahaz is the very good king, King Hezekiah. 2 Kings 18 says of him, He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. He removes the pillars, he removes the high places, he cuts down the Asherah, and he even rebels against Assyria. On a couple occasions, however, Assyria sends its army to siege Jerusalem. Hezekiah, in a very difficult situation, consults with the prophet Isaiah, who reassures him that the Lord is on Judah's side. And during the second siege of Jerusalem, 185,000 soldiers of Assyria are struck down by an angel of the Lord. Fortunately, Judah is spared. However, the northern kingdom of Israel is not. In the year 722 BC, Assyria takes Samaria, the capital of Israel, and takes away all the people of the northern ten kingdoms into captivity. They are then dispersed among the many other lands belonging to Assyria, becoming the lost tribes of Israel. This is the sad conclusion to the kingdom of Israel. And while a small portion remain in the land, only the southern kingdom of Judah remains intact. However, the seeds of its destruction are sown here during the reign of Hezekiah as well. For Hezekiah receives an envoy from the new kingdom of Babylon. And mistakenly, 
he shows these emissaries all the treasures of his kingdom. After their departure, Isaiah proclaims the destruction of Judah at the hands of Babylon, which indeed ensues in 587 and 586 BC, where Jerusalem is finally besieged, assaulted, and totally destroyed by the armies of Babylon. This completes an overview of the kings Rehoboam through Hezekiah, these kings of Judah. They all have ups and downs, but mostly downs, as the kings and the people abandon their worship of God to worship idols and gods of neighboring nations. While the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed, the southern kingdom of Judah continues for several more generations and for seven further kings, and their reigns and their final confrontation with the new empire of Babylon we will cover in the next video on the kings of Judah. So thank you for joining along in this review of the kings from Rehoboam through Hezekiah, and may God bless you today.